Welcome everyone to the Casa video presentation, where today we will be briefly discussing the entire process which a team of archaeologists goes through when studying a site, also mentioning the key aspects and tools used by these professionals. Our focus will be the Tassilch excavation site, where a team made up of students from the Department of Classics and Archaeology at the University of Malta, in collaboration with Heritage Malta and the Superintendents of Cultural Heritage, excavated in summer 2019 with plans for further excavation campaigns in the future. The site known as Tassilj is located in the southeast of Malta, overlooking Marsashlog Bay to its south. Its name derives from a nearby chapel dedicated to Our Lady of the Snows, Tassilj. However, the actual hill upon which the site is located is actually called Tabirika. Archaeological remains from the site are first recorded in 1647 by Giovanni Francesco Abela, a Maltese historiographer of the Knights of St. John. A detailed illustration engraved by the French traveller Jean Hall in 1787 depicted a long wall in ashlar masonry, which survived up to several courses high. The engraving depicts the ashlar wall along a road frequented by shepherds and local travellers and is now known to belong to that of the Zaytun de Lemara Road, Trishoflajin, which bisects the archaeological site. The earliest definite human occupation of the site is determined by the presence of a megalithic structure dating to the Tarshan phase, 2000 to 2500 before Christ, of the Maltese Neolithic. In antiquity, the sanctuary at Tassilj built a reputation as a sacred place of worship dedicated to the goddess Juno. The Roman orator and lawyer Cicero, writing in the 1st century BC, refers to the sanctuary to Juno on several occasions in his prosecution speeches. Coordinates passed on to us by the ancient geographer Ptolemy in the 2nd century AD refers to two sanctuaries, one to Juno, the other to Hercules. In fact, succe succeeding historiographers and travelers had always identified the remains they witnessed and described as belonging to the later temple to Hercules. It was only following the intensive excavations of the site by an Italian archaeological mission between 1963 and in 1970, that the extent of the remains and the study of the artifacts retrieved confirmed that the sanctuary was in fact dedicated to Juno and not to Hercules. The first large scale archaeological excavation of Tassilj were carried out by an Italian archaeological mission who was invited to Malta in 1963 by the newly elected government of Malta. The Italian mission's objectives were to explore the archaeological potential of the Maltese islands' historic period, Phoenician and later. In order to achieve these objectives, the Italian mission decided on carrying out intensive excavations at three sites, Tassilj and San Paumel in Malta, and Rasil Wardia in Gozo. Eight campaigns were carried out between 1963 and 1970, each followed by the publication of a preliminary report. In 1996, the Department of Classics and Archaeology from the University of Malta carried out the first season of what became a decade-long investigation at the southern half of the site. The aims of the University of Malta campaigns were to investigate the southern extent of the site's masonry and accumulated deposits that formed artificial dumps beyond the sanctuary's limits. The project was also instrumental in the fieldwork training of an entire generation of archaeology students reading for a BA at the University of Malta. In 2015, a two-volume final report of the six archaeological investigations by University of Malta was published along a series of detailed studies of the material culture. A significant number of pottery fragments excavated from the site, belonging mostly to bowls, plates and cooking pots, were inscribed with the Punic letters invoking the Punic female deity Ashtarte. A few inscriptions were also found invoking the goddess Hera in Greek letters, thus confirming the link with the famed temple to Juno, the Roman equivalent of the Punic Ashtarte and the Greek Hera, first mentioned by Cicero in the 1st century BC. Pottery dating to the end of the 8th and the beginning of the 7th century BC confirms the existence of a Phoenician presence on site. The Phoenicians structured their temple by following and incorporating the megalithic walls of the Tarshan phase temple, thus respecting the previous prehistoric place of worship. Remains of a facade incorporating two walls with access in and out of the building have been linked to this Phoenician period restructuring. A central limestone ground altar located at the entrance is also contemporary with this phase of the site's use. 
The sanctuary of Castilch appears to have prospered throughout the later Punic occupation of the island. Extensive reconstructing works were conducted between the end of the 2nd and the beginning of the 1st century BC. The central courtyard, enveloped by the portico and paved using stone slabs, covered the previous Phoenician structures and remained unroofed. Later activity is recorded by the presence of late Roman and Byzantine pottery, dating to at least the 6th and 7th centuries AD. The present project is being carried out to investigate the archaeology within the footprint of the ruins of a farmhouse, which stood on the edge of the site's northern enclosure. The, the investigation aims to trace the extent of any archaeological features that exist beneath the footprint of the farmhouse. With this in mind, a number of exploratory trenches were excavated with the purpose of answering three important questions. 1. What archaeological remains survived beneath the historic farmhouse? 2. The limits of excavation reached by the Italian archaeological mission. 3. Secure areas that are free of archaeological remains and which can be used as footings for a visitor center structure. The first season of renowned excavation at, Tus at the Tustil sanctuary proved to be highly informative and rewarding. It is clear that substantial archaeological remains still survive beneath the immediate footprint of the farmhouse, much of which escaped excavation by the Italian mission in the 1960s. After the detailed introduction, we will be now showing exclusive drone footage taken in the summer 2019, which shows the different features and aspects of the Tustilch site. Extensive restructuring works were conducted between the end of the 2nd and the beginning of the 1st century BC. The central courtyard, enveloped by the portico and paved using stone slabs, covered the previous Phoenician structures, the ground altar and the edifice walls, and remained unroofed. Later activity is recorded by the presence of late Roman and Byzantine pottery dating to at least the 6th and 7th centuries AD. The present project is being carried out to investigate the archaeology within the footprint of the ruins of a farmhouse, which stood on the edge of the site's northern enclosure. The investigation aims to trace the extent of any archaeological feature that exists beneath the footprint of the farmhouse. With this in mind, a number of exploratory trenches were excavated with the purpose of answering three important questions. Question 1. What archaeological remains survived beneath the historic farmhouse? Question 2. The limits of excavation reached by the Italian archaeological mission. And question 3. Secure areas that are free of archaeological remains and which can be used as footings for a visitor center structure. The first season of renowned excavation at the Tustil Sanctuary proved to be highly informative and rewarding. It is clear that substantial archaeological remains still survive beneath the immediate footprint of the farmhouse, much of which escaped excavation by the Italian mission in the 1960s. After the detailed introduction, we will now be showing exclusive drone footage taken in the summer 2019, which shows the different features and aspects of the Tustil site.
After talking about some of the history found at Tustridge and the number of excavation campaigns that took place during the year, we now shift our focus to more specific elements of what constitutes an archaeological excavation. Elements which, when combined together, enable the archaeologists to create a picture of the period in question. One very important principle one must keep in mind when excavating is the concept of stratigraphy, which is the primary route to an understanding of the activity represented in the archaeological record. The majority of archaeological sites are composed of stratified sequences, and a single action, whether it leaves a positive or negative record within the sequence, is known as a stratigraphic unit, abbreviated STU. Stratigraphy is the study of layered materials, strata, that were deposited over time. The basic law of stratigraphy, the law of superposition, states that lower layers are older than upper layers, unless the sequence has been overturned. According to the law of superposition, in a given series of layers, as originally created, the upper layers are younger, meaning more recent, and the lower layers older, because each layer presumably has been added to a pre-existing deposit. Based on this law, archaeologists have been able to assign dates in relative sequence to stratified layers. Stratified deposits may include soils, sediments and rocks, as well as man-made features such as pits and post holes. The adoption of stratigraphic principles by archaeologists greatly improved excavation and archaeological dating methods. By digging from the top downward, the archaeologists can trace the buildings and objects on the site back through time using techniques of typology. Object types, particularly types of pottery, can be compared with those found at other sites in order to reconstruct a period in time or patterns of trade and communication between ancient cultures. After comparing natural strata and man-made strata, Archaeologists are often able to determine a stratigraphic sequence, a chronological order of various layers, interfaces, and stratigraphic disturbances. The Harris matrix is a very useful tool which was invented in 1973 by Dr. Edward Harris. Archaeologists use this tool to keep track of stratigraphy and stratigraphic units. By using the laws of stratigraphy, archaeologists create logic diagrams to record the top down sequence of stratigraphic deposits and help make sense of the information they contain. It is often much easier to determine similarities and make sense of the different historical periods through the use of the Harris matrix. While they can be simple as the one shown on screen now, they can also be more complicated, such as these, or even more than the provided example. The need of maintaining a record is very important to archaeologists. Every deposit or cut has a separate written description, compiled on a general stratigraphic unit record sheet, or a few sheet for short. Each sheet has a set of key categories which need to be filled for each SU, including color, compaction, and thickness. While the filling of these sheets may be seen tedious on site, they are a very important record to have since an archaeological excavation is a destructive exercise, which means that once you excavate an area, it is destroyed, and you cannot go back to it. So it is very important to have a detailed record of what was found, and notice every step of the way, so researchers working on the site in the future can visualize as much as possible what you worked on. As important as the written record is, the drawn record is just as important, as it gives the possibility of visualizing each area, and to exchanges from one SU to another, even after the actual material has been excavated. It is for this reason that these plans or sections, as they are called, involve a lot of planning, and it is crucial that the measurements are taken right. Even if the measurements are a few centimeters off, this may result in complications down the line, when a person who was not on site tries to piece the puzzle together. Each SU or a group of SUs are planned on sheets of gridded drafting film. The drawing area on the pre-cut sheets that are used on site represents an area of 5 by 5 meters at a scale of 1 to 20, the standard recording scale. This 5 meter square relates to the archaeological site survey grid established across the entire area of excavation and marked by metal dowels. A separate plan number is given to each plan and recorded in the plan and sections register. Sections or elevations are also drawn when necessary. These are usually at the scale of 1 to 10. The sections and elevations have a numbering system that must also be noted in the plans and sections register whenever a new section is drawn. A plan gives a horizontal, phase down picture of the area which is being worked on, while a section gives a vertical slice of a wall or a feature. Another very important source of information for archaeologists is the use of surveying on site. One must remember that the archaeological site has to be located within a spatial context. 
meaning that coordinates of certain finds have to be accurately recorded using the right equipment. This provides part of the data of a complete archaeological record of the site and also provides a frame of reference which allows different locations to be explored in different areas of the site and at different times or even over a number of years to be correlated to each other. Surveying is also used to permit reconstruction and analysis of the site and permit future location of features after these are covered over and backfilled. One of the most commonly used tools by surveyors and archaeologists on site is the use of the auto level. The auto level is a tool that's easy to set up. It allows calculation of height above sea level of a particular point on site. The calculation starts off from a known point on site known as a benchmark. The first reading which is taken is used to calculate how high the instrument itself is above sea level which varies according to the person and specific area it is being used on. Once this reading is known, the reading of the point, one once recorded, is taken and then subtracted from the first reading to get a record of the height above sea level. These levels are recorded in their notebook along with the drawn plans. A total station is a device that measures coordinates of a certain position. It has two parts, a machine mounted on a tripod and a target prism on a metal staff, which is moved around the site. Total stations were developed in civil engineering, but like many other items of equipment, they can be used for archaeological purposes. The total station has a lens that one looks through like a telescope. The whole instrument swivels horizontally and the lens itself moves vertically. The total station sends out a tiny light signal which bounces back from the prism and gives the coordinates of its position. It is very important for an archaeologist to keep a record of the work being done on site. Apart from the detailed written and drawn records, keeping a visual record using photography is also very important. A record of each stratigraphic unit should be kept especially before they are excavated and lost forever. Photographs of specific features or finds found on site are taken. Being able to compare and combine the information gathered from a written, drawn and visual record is very useful for an archaeologist. All sites in artefact photography must include a scale, normally a rod or ruler marked in metres or millimetres, and usually also a signboard saying which area, context or find is being recorded. This is essential for post-excavation, where there may be dozens or even hundreds of similar shots being taken. It is important to remember when assembling a final site archive that photographs deteriorate with age and exposure to sunlight. Nowadays, aerial photographs are also becoming increasingly important for recording purposes. The easy access to unmanned aerial vehicles or drones has made it much easier to take elevated shots which help to uncover more features or formations which may go unnoticed from ground level. It is often recommended that the site is first cleaned so that none of the features are lost. Archaeology is benefiting from developments in technology that are introducing new recording systems such as 3D modelling. Innovative digital recordings are improving key aspects of archaeological practice, including accuracy and efficiency. These photorealistic 3D models can be processed further using building information modelling to create plans, sections, digital elevation models, author photographs and other types of images useful for analysis and publication. By taking overlapping photographic shots of a feature or a specific area, it is possible for a 3D model to be created. A 3D model allows archaeologists to view and study all archaeological features together. 
an action that may not always be possible on site, as features may deteriorate or be destroyed with time. Lighting is often an element to consider when taking these photographs, as they need to complement and overlap each other with all these important features and details that need to be seen clearly. While archaeology is a destructive process, as has been mentioned a number of times before, tools do now exist which may help in choosing a site instead of another. Ground penetrating radar, or GPR, is a system used in, in geophysics to scan, map, and record information about the Earth's subsurface. Archaeologists have employed this technical procedure for several years, and it is also common in other scientific fields such as environmental studies, geology, and even civil engineering. Archaeological geophysics involves methods to collect data that permits the field archaeologist to image and map underlying archaeological features, which are otherwise impossible to detect using traditional field methods. Archaeologists can take advantage of the physical and chemical changes within the ground relative to the presence of or absence of subterranean objects. Using highly sensitive instruments, the specialist technician can measure, map, and interpret the data signals received by the GPR system into useful information for planning the excavation. The greatest advantage of ground penetrating radar is that they offer non-invasive and non-destructive way to collect information about the near surface. Large sites with concealed remains can be viewed and analyzed efficiently and accurately while preserving the site. GPR maps offer useful primary survey data that can be used to establish sites for excavation or even identify sensitive areas where cultural remains such as burial sites could be found and may need special extraction process and therefore the information can guide archaeologists to avoid disturbing or destroying these locations. The sedimentary strata and buried artifacts have a, part, uh, have a peculiar physical and chemical composition. This influences the, the velocity of the electromagnetic wave spread, the electrical conductivity and magnetic permeability. Differences or variations in the waves received signify the presence of objects, voids, and changes in physical properties. Pattern in the subsurface imaging are, off, are indicative of underlying archaeological features, such as architecture or artifacts. Making sure that the site you excavate is a productive and important one ensures that less destruction is made and less information possibly lost. It is often thought that the work of an archaeologist finishes once the excavation is concluded, but this is not often the case. In fact, most of the research and analysis where it comes at the post-excavation stage, where it defines all records written, drawn, and visual, and the initial conclusions gathered on site are carefully studied. It is at this stage where all units of stratigraphy are grouped together using tools such as the Harris matrix to recreate the most likely order of the stratigraphy of the site. Work in post-excavation includes pottery washing, where each pottery shirt is washed with caution and a toothbrush to make sure that the dirt which has accumulated over the years is brushed away without damaging any details or decoration which can be found on the shirt. Once washed, the pottery offers its real color and this is when inscriptions or decorations are often found. After washing, these shirts are left to dry in the sun. Bags are changed with the so-called diagnostic shirts, the rims, handles, and bases separated into individual bags. The same bag is in turn placed inside the original bag, which contains any remaining non-diagnostic shirts. Inking, also, inking is also another important part of this post-excavation process. After a pottery shirt, has been properly washed and cleaned from any organic deposits and well dried, one coat of paraloid is applied with a small flat brush on a bottom corner 
or the, on the reverse or inner surface of the shirt. Once this coat is dried properly, a calligraphic pen with Indian ink is used to write the side coat on the pottery shirt. A final protective coat of paraloid is then applied over the ink and left to dry. Further analysis has become possible in recent years to further understand the composition of pottery itself. Here we can see how archaeology and science can work together to achieve further information. For ancient ceramics, the, method, the, method, the methodological exact sciences have their beginning in the, sixth century, in the sixth decade of the 20th century, when it was widely used in X-ray in X-ray diffract, diffraction techniques, investigation of thermal expansion and optical micro, microscopy, ceramic artifact analysis. In the next decade, new analytical methods such as differential thermal analysis and, electrical, and electron microscopy have been explored. The use of these methods allowed for a better understanding of structural changes due to the different types of clay burning at different temperatures, which allowed the extraction of information enabling an economic and social outline of the communities that produce these artifacts. At present, the world can identify and understand most stages of the technological process of making ceramics in different chronological periods and in different, in, in different cultures. It is important to use modern chemical analysis, both non-destructive methods and at times destructive methods of modern microanalysis for small sample analysis. They may be extremely valuable in the provenance investigation of an object, the origin of the materials used for its manufacture, in determining its degradation state and to choose the most suitable methods of restoration and conservation, the type of materials for conservation, and also in monitoring the progress of conservation processes, or to identify fake objects. The main aspects of ceramic characterization are classification, production technology, and provenance through specific techniques for chemical and mineralogical characterization. We have now come to the end of our video presentation on the process of an archaeological investigation and some of the tools that may be used to gather information. We hope you have found this presentation interesting and it instills the possibility of some of you to look for a career in archaeology. Thank you very much.